Amazon has retailers everywhere scared. Once an online bookstore, Amazon now sells just about anything you would find in a home or business and has developed a formidable formula, low prices and fast delivery. Meanwhile, storied and once dominant US retail chains everywhere are struggling, faced with monumental shifts in the way consumers shop. Once remarkably durable brands have shuttered their stores, which sometimes number in the hundreds. The more than century old retailer Sears, once the country's largest chain, filed for chapter 11 bankruptcy in 2018, just one of the many victims of the so-called retail apocalypse. There is no question, the world is dramatically different than it was even a decade ago. So how do traditional retailers survive? Some answers may lie with Best Buy. It might seem to be a relic of a bygone era. Much of its business model is based on large format physical stores, pretty much the very definition of what is failing across the industry. But Best Buy is killing it. Shares are hovering near an all-time high, fueled by a transformation centered on in-store service and stocking its shelves with new key products in healthcare and smart homes. It is a rebirth many in the industry consider miraculous. In 2012, Best Buy was in dire shape. Sales were plummeting, morale had tanked, and executives were scrambling to save the company. Within the space of just a few years, a retail giant that employed nearly 170,000 people and dominated its industry nearly died. Then, somehow, it didn't. While retailers such as Toys R Us bit the dust, Best Buy bucked the trend. Now, the CEO who pulled off this miraculous turnaround is stepping down, and the company's CFO will now steer the revived retailer and fend off still growing threats. So how did Best Buy engineer such a renaissance? Is its massive recovery sustainable, and can it be replicated? Best Buy's origins can be traced back to St. Paul, Minnesota in the late 1960s. Electronics salesman Richard Schultz founded a store in the area called Sound of Music. It sold stereos, speakers, vinyl records, and other audio equipment. It grew into a chain, but the business found greater success after Schultz adopted the big box format. The Best Buy concept was born, and Schultz renamed the store in 1983. Let me introduce you to a new kind of store, Sound of Music's Best Buy Superstore in Burn. Two years later, it went public. Growth was slow at first. In its first decade as a public company, its stock only peaked at a high of $5.03 in late 1994. But over the next 20 years, Best Buy became the largest U.S. seller of electronics in the golden age of America's big box retailers. These big stores, modeled on warehouses, really rose to dominance in the 1980s and 1990s, and they spread across segments. Home Depot and Lowe's became major home improvement stores. Petco and PetSmart ruled the pets category. Stores such as Bed Bath & Beyond and Linens and & Things dominated home goods. Best Buy was considered a best-in-class retailer, and the growth was spectacular. Best Buy had 679 stores at the end of 2003. By the end of 2009, it had 3,889. Sales climbed from roughly 21 billion to 45 billion over the same period. Its stock jumped to above $50 a share. But Amazon was starting to rise in the late 1990s and it seemed to offer deals too good to refuse. It could sell a customer the same exact products they could find in a store, but often at lower prices and with free shipping. Due to the nature of e-commerce, Amazon often did not have to charge sales tax, which could make a huge difference in price on high-ticket items like televisions or appliances. Amazon's first wave of success began to shake out smaller competitors, such as CompUSA and Tweeter. But it took a bit longer and a few other blows to dent bigger players like Circuit City, which during Best Buy's heyday was its biggest competitor. In 2008, Circuit City was fending off an activist investor who wanted to shake up its management. Then the financial crisis hit and sparked a slowdown in consumer spending that culminated in the Great Recession. In November 2008, it filed for bankruptcy, and with the lack of credit, it was forced to liquidate. Circuit City closed its last 567 stores in 2009. At that point, the retailer had been around for more than 60 years, and it had more than 700 stores in its heyday. Circuit City's demise gave Best Buy a bit of a tailwind. Industry sales were down about 10% that year, 
but as Circuit City began closing up stores, shoppers shifted to Best Buy. The result, Best Buy sales fell only 5%. It had gone from being the biggest of several national electronics chains to the only one left. But competing with fellow brick and mortar stores like this was what Best Buy was used to, and the rapidly ascending Amazon was another beast entirely. Analysts who follow Best Buy say the company might have underestimated the threat from the Seattle-based e-commerce giant. The Amazon threat for years had been masked by the arrival of the flat screen television. Massive technological leaps to sleek televisions with crystal clear pictures motivated people all over the country to go out and buy new sets. Perhaps the best years for the product cycle were 2005 and 2006, but retailers benefited for the better part of the decade as e-commerce continued to quietly strengthen its grip on the market. But by the time the Great Recession began to hit, Best Buy started to suffer. A slowing housing market in 2007 hit sales of appliances and large home electronics, and the following financial crisis dried up credit and tightened consumer spending around the country. Finding the lowest prices possible on what items a buyer could afford became even more of a priority. Best Buy same-store sales fell 1.3% in 2008. Things turned around briefly in 2009, but same-store sales fell again every year from 2010 through 2013. Best Buy went from pulling in $1.2 billion in net income in 2011 to a $1 billion loss in 2012 and another $443 million loss in 2013. Other things happening at the company did not exactly inspire confidence among investors. Then CEO Brian Dunn, a lifelong Best Buy employee who had started as a blue shirt worker on the store floor, resigned in 2012. This came after news surfaced that he may have had a relationship with a younger female employee. The fallout from the episode led Schultz to resign as chairman. In 2012, Best Buy's board brought in Hubert Jolie, a relative outsider who had previously worked at McKinsey and Vivendi, where he approved the launch of successful video games such as World of Warcraft. It is Jolie's tenure that is credited with turning the company around. When he joined, it was a, a very tumultuous time at Best Buy. Uh, as a retail analyst with almost 20 years of experience, uh, there are very few retailers that I've experienced uh, going through such a period of, of, of hatred and concern as Best Buy was going through in 2012. Uh, if you looked at valuation metrics, uh, the stock was priced as if this was a company that was going to go bankrupt within five years. And the initial reaction from the Wall Street community and investors was, who is Hubert Jolie and how is this man going to save Best Buy? The new CEO and his staff began cutting costs and investing in parts of Best Buy's business that gave it advantages over its online competitors. That started with service and stores. Up to that point, Best Buy was one of many retailers faced with a problem sometimes referred to as showrooming, where customers would walk into a store to inspect and learn about products they wanted, only to go home and buy them online, often via Amazon and usually at cheaper prices. So Best Buy had to take the fight to them, and it did so by leveraging its large network of stores, matching Amazon's prices and focusing on providing the customer service an online retailer can't. In 2012, Best Buy began matching any price on an item anyone could find elsewhere. That meant a customer checking out a stereo system, computer, or phone could walk out of one of Best Buy's stores with that product on that day and pay the same price. The company also started shipping online orders directly from stores, turning every store into a small warehouse, which increased Best Buy's available inventory and shortened delivery times. They also put in place an easy process for returning online products in stores, saving customers the trouble of packing something back up in a box. If you think about it, all, all of retail right now is working aggressively to become omnichannel. And that's their advantage versus the web. They have physical stores. Why not leverage that? Use those stores as pickup points, drop-off points, shipping points. The, the, the web can't really do that. The web, that last mile is really where the stores can come in and try to be more effective. And you've seen that, you know, Walmart, Target, Costco, they're going big time after the omnichannel consumer. Best Buy also began working closely with the store's vendors, which many say has been a crucial step in the company's turnaround. The company started giving electronics makers their own dedicated sections of Best Buy stores. 
This store within a store concept was mutually beneficial to both Best Buy and these tech firms. The first deal during Jolie's tenure was with Korean electronics maker Samsung in April of 2013. Then Microsoft followed. Best Buy also made a deal with Apple to revamp its displays, even worked with Amazon to be the exclusive seller of smart TVs embedded with Amazon's Fire TV technology. The retailer keeps the exact details of these deals close to its chest, but essentially it shares the cost of investments and the revenues with each manufacturer. In turn, device makers can exercise greater control over how their products are presented to customers. They can set up their displays and tailor the shopping experience much the way they want. They often bring their own staff into the stores who obviously know their products best. Customers can learn about something directly from its manufacturer, and Best Buy employees can receive training from the vendors. This arrangement gives sometimes fierce competitors, such as Google, Apple, and Amazon, a kind of neutral ground where each can sell their competing products side by side. The store within a store concept deepened the symbiotic relationship between the retailer and its suppliers and kept them invested in Best Buy's survival and success. Best Buy's troubles had spelled danger for many of these device makers, who do not really have their own physical retail networks. But in talking to suppliers, that was a scary time for them. All of a sudden, they started to think about what, what if we're in a world where there is no Best Buy? And I think suppliers realized that that, that was not a, a pleasant world. And I think the, the message was to, to suppliers from Best Buy, is, you need us as much as we need you. And so, you know, help, help to support us. And, and we will showcase and sell your products. The company also bet on service both inside and outside its stores. Best Buy invested in training for its floor employees, commonly known as blue shirts, for the polo shirts they wear. The retailer figured that a store can offer customers something online typically does not, flesh and blood authorities on products who can answer questions and make recommendations. One of the pillars of Best Buy's approach to service is its Geek Squad division, which it acquired back in 2002. Geek Squad sends technicians to homes to set up, troubleshoot, and repair electronics, bought at Best Buy or elsewhere. The group has a membership program and aims to be a comprehensive in-home service that will set up, fix, or troubleshoot anything that plugs into a wall, from home theaters to networking devices to appliances. Geek Squad has 23 years of experience making house calls and currently employs 20,000 people who make 33 million total interactions with consumers a year including 1.8 million home visits, according to Jefferies. Geek Squad and other services make up a small but growing portion of Best Buy's revenues. The chain pulled in about 5% of its sales from services in 2018, up from about 4% the previous year. Best Buy is betting that as our homes fill up with complex interconnected devices, customers will increasingly want one company that can tackle everything. It is also pushing into new product areas it thinks offer potentially high margins, such as smart home technology and healthcare. In 2018, it acquired Great Call for $800 million. Great Call makes smartphones and wearables aimed at older adults and sells a service customers can use to quickly access caregivers and first responders. The work has paid off. Best Buy shares have risen from a high of $44.66 a share in 2013 to $75.91 a share in 2019. Same store sales have grown every year since 2015. In the process, the company is becoming something of a model for other retailers, showing how businesses can steer through a competitive and rapidly changing technology-fueled retail market. Now that Best Buy has turned itself around, though, the question is, where does it go from here? Jolie is stepping down, and Best Buy has appointed its chief financial officer, Corey Berry, to the top job. Berry oversees the company's service division and its health division, and was a key player in the Great Call acquisition. And she's a veteran. She's worked at the company since 1999. Analysts say Berry is certainly qualified to take the job, and she's well-liked by Wall Street. But Jolie's shoes will not be easy to fill. Corey Barry is, is a very strong leader within the Best Buy organization, and I think she's going to be great as the next CEO. She has big shoes to fill. Hubert Jolie did a phenomenal job turning Best Buy around and making it relevant again. But I think um, Corey Barry is a very strong operating uh, background and strategic thinking background that's going to help her to achieve great things in the future for Best Buy. For now, the company is focused on execution. It has put together some plans that give it a solid chance at a future. But what about competitors? Amazon, after all, surprised the world by buying Whole Foods and entering the grocery business. 
Best Buy is still the largest seller of electronics. It sold $32.4 billion in electronics in 2017, a 5% increase over the previous year, according to industry publication Twice. But Amazon was not far behind, selling $30.1 billion worth, a 4% increase over 2016. Could the online giant move onto Best Buy's turf once again, this time with its own stores? For now, Best Buy has found a way to dig deep into what it knows, electronics. It has also leveraged its strengths in stores and service while beefing up its online presence. Analysts are optimistic, but this is an era of unprecedented disruption, and there is a long list of retailers that have gone out of business in electronics alone. If Best Buy expects to stick around, it needs to keep a pretty wide moat between it and rivals, especially Amazon.